Well, unfortunately, I don't get to talk about wine today. It's something much more boring, uh, which is financial data. Um, actually, I think it's quite interesting. And um, the last panel sort of set up a skeleton of what we might do, um, how we might bring about better models with uh, financial data. And I'm going to try in this talk to put a little flesh on the bone and say, what have we already done? What does this data look like? Uh, so I'll start with a simple proposition. It's almost lunchtime, uh, which is that if we are truly what we eat, one might know a man by where he shops for food, which is to say two things. The first is that money talks. Individuals have a signal, a signature. And the second is that we're driven to our signature places, whether they be whole foods or fast foods, by some of the same characteristic desires. In this case, a search for sustenance. Now, we all know that micro decisions aggregate to larger economic patterns. And as Alistair said, I've been studying that most base, vile, and yet wildly entertaining of micro decisions, the credit card swipe. There are about six million cards in the U.S., and for the past couple of years, I've been partnered with a large financial institution to look at about 100 million of these anonymized, de-identified accounts um, to do something that, uh, because I'm a sort of a, in academia, I can do things that are considered useless to the current um, business models of banks, which to caricature them are to build these ever more Byzantine models of, of risk and fraud. Um, and, and this is certainly not to villainize banks. There are plenty of others uh, more adept at doing that than I. Uh, but rather to suggest what other things we might do with this data uh, that may indeed be useful to understanding human behavior, uh, informing epidemiological models or models of uh, traffic and mobility. Uh, so the basic idea is to treat each data point or each credit card swipe as a data point in a sort of sensor network to ask uh, how people move around, how habits develop and break, and how institutions and individuals are connected. So I'll present some of these, three of these findings quickly using a couple of vignettes. The first concerns the albatross. Now, scientists have been fascinated by this bird's flight patterns for some time. And in fact, they've discovered that a number of species of birds and insects search for their different sources of food in characteristic ways. And it's not, as was once imagined by physicists, according to the Brownian motion of particles, but rather flight, with flight lengths drawn from a Levi or fat tail distribution, multiple short steps punctuated by several long flights. And in looking at cell phones and credit cards, we find that humans are not all too different. Um, we return to many of the same spots, and sometimes we do these long explorations. Where we are different is that we're actually much more predictable. We go, we spend about 40% of our time at our top handful of spots. And this is perhaps because our food sources are always in the same places and they're constantly replenished, if you think of McDonald's or the produce aisle at Walmart. Um, but it's also that we're fundamentally predictable creatures. This is one individual's pattern of store visits over six months and the transitions between them. And although the store is different, others, individuals, look much the same. Where we do differ is in our appetite for novelty. And you can actually see differences in how wealthier and poorer people behave along these lines. Uh, so wealthy people tend to, if we, if we think as... Um, and it's flight distance, a flight distance as a distance from the ordinary rather than physical distance. They tend to explore much more than their less wealthy counterparts. They actually behave a lot like birds in low resource environments. The environment doesn't fit their needs. The, the second vignette borrows a, an analogy from biology, the idea of genetic drift, to ask, can we build a model that describes the change in a, a person's shopping habits over time? The first observation is that not all shopping visits are created equal. We, we go to places with different kinds of regularity. So the grocery store, we might replenish our, you know, our fridges and pantries with much more regularity. And there's some correlation between the standard deviation between those times and the longevity of the habit. Um, so we can build, informed by this idea of genetic drift, we can actually build a model that says, you know, we'll take the parameters of exploration or innovation, going to new stores, and the idea of memory, how far back do I look to choose uh, the, the basket of stores I'll go to, 
and say, can we predict what that, what that turnover will look like? This has been done, for example, in other, with other cultural patterns like the rise and fall of baby names. Um, it turns out the difference in shopping habits is that uh, this model works. It has to be adapted because our top several habits are extra sticky. So they stick around longer than a random model would predict. Uh, the final vignette concerns individuals and institutions. And one of the richnesses of a financial data set of transactions or commercial data is that it actually offers a cross-section of the economy. We can look at cash flows between companies to see how institutions are connected or at employer-employee relationships to understand how that network works. Um, so we can do things like look at cash flows across all sectors of the economy or perhaps to, to drill down on to individual companies and see how the risk of a, of a company affects uh, the risk of default of an individual working for a company, which is not something that, uh, that banks traditionally take into account when calculating total exposure, for example. So the bottom line is we live in this world made of money. Money drives where we go, and our desires it, uh, dictate our mobility patterns. Um, so through these three vignettes, I've tried to present a few ideas about what might be done given the right constraints um, for a the right frameworks for data privacy and, um, and sharing, what might be done with this data. This data is important um, for some of us because it allows us to sell people something new. Uh, but I'd also argue that these data represent, um, represent they're, they're the financial footprints that together comprise the invisible hand, and they could say something about human nature as well. Thank you. <laughs>